Hi, this is Jay Morreale, P. Brain LLC. I'm a finalist in the Forget Me Not Design Challenge at Element 14 and received a big box in the mail today. According to the backing list, it's the EOP 350 in Ocean Kit and a Tektronix 1052B oscilloscope. And we're going to open the box and find out what we got. All right, here we go. Okay, here we go, we have the In Ocean ELP 350 kit. Uh, <coughs> the okay. Okay, here we have the In Ocean EOP 350 Universal Programmer Board. And what you can see here is a spot for a TCM radio module, a uh, InOcean Pi, and a sensor port. So the, the radio goes on. So we have the radio. This is the um, InOcean uh, TCM 320U and it plugs on to the board like so. So you can see the orientation of the antennas over here and that matches the silk screen and you can see that pin number one here also matches pin number one on on the uh, TCM 320. Now only one board is um, programmed at a time so We'll remove that in keeping with that uh, fact that I re learned recently. And then we have the STM uh, 332U, and this is the temperature sensor module. And you can see I removed the little jumper thing. And this one plugs into this 20 pin spot right here. Let's see if I can do this. And it's a little tricky to get aligned. Got them all in there. All right, so, and you can see that the antenna goes out this way, and you can see the out, outline for the um, STM300 series. So once you get your module in to your, um, into your board, you plug in the USB cable and connect it up to your computer to control and program these devices use the Dolphin Studio um, in order to see the radio traffic with the uh, TCM module you use the Dolphin View Advanced. Looking at the Tektronix oscilloscope this is uh, the inner shipping box We have some packing material certificate. Oops. We have a packing material certificate of compliance and talking about firmware. We we'll save these for later. We have a standard power cable. Scope uh, color markers, scope scope probe markers, uh, some software, compliance and safety manual, and some looks like looks like two, a set of pro, uh, oscilloscope probes and some accessories for them. Wow, 
these things have gotten a lot smaller. Wow. Okay, so here we go. This is the TBS 1052 EDU. Take it out of its little plastic box. Get a better view. You can see the nice large screen. USB port. All the scope controls on the sides. Looks like we have a, a nice little carrying handle for it. On off switch. USB connector. Oh, power connector. Feet. And that looks like the extent of the I.O. Very clean, simple lines. Okay, we have the uh, Tektronics TBS 1052B EDU digital oscilloscope powered up now. And I have one of the 50 megahertz 10X probes connected to the um, probe compensation signal. On, and uh, channel one is set up for DC company, DC coupling, uh, no, no bandwidth limit, uh, course uh, uh, adjust. I've got the 10X probe settings set off and the invert turned off. Um, I adjusted the time base to give me a few a few signals and so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the cursors and just see what the amplitude measurement is. Um, so what you do is you just touch the type, use the uh, multi-purpose button here and scroll it up and down. The um, selected item off amplitude time uh, has the selected item has a little bit lighter blue than the rest and you just hit the center button to select it or if it's already selected you hit it again it'll unselect it and so now I have the cursors set and uh, the, the top cursor the first cursor is shows up here we're just going to move it down to the top of the trace and then we'll go to the cursor number two and scroll down to the bottom of the trace. Multi-purpose button. And it looks like the peak-to-peak -peak signal is 5.04 volts and it's shown here on the display. I'm not sure you can see that on this. Okay, so now um, what we'll do is we'll go back to the cursor, do the uh, select the time cursors, and select cursor 1 and adjust it right on the rising edge. Select cursor number two and select the other, the next rising edge. And that says that we are 1.02 kilohertz or uh, a period of 180 microseconds. That seems a little off to me, so what we're going to do expand it out and get a little bit better. See if we can adjust our display here to get a full trace over the full. Doesn't look like we're going to make it, so we'll do one less here. And then cursor number two. And then that says warp 1.01 kilohertz or 990 microseconds. So that's what the cursor tells us. We'll go over to the measurement feature and we'll pick channel one and we'll pick the frequency on the measurement tab and push the center button. Oops. And you can see that it's calculating the frequency down here as 1.009 kilohertz. All right, so that's a quick demonstration of the operation of the scope. So what we've got here is we've got the Raspberry Pi. It's powered. 
uh, I have a, a audio video breakout cable that brings the left and right channels to the um, channel 1 and channel 2 of the scope. So this is left, this is right. Um, uh, the Raspberry Pi is connected to my LAN wirelessly and I have my phone set up with something called ConnectBot um, and that allows me to send commands to the Raspberry Pi remotely without my laptop. So we're going to see how this goes here, a little bit of an experiment. Um, what I want to do is uh, test the uh, right and left channels of the Raspberry Pi using the scope. All right, so um, what we've done is we've set up each channel. Um, since I'm not using a scope probe on the channel on the channel um, sol vertical selection buttons, I've got ch channel one set for AC coupling. Each one kind of centered in its kind of little zone here. Uh, I've turned the bandwidth limit on because the audio signals are very small and it's a little noisy because these aren't the greatest cables. I tried using coax cables, but the Raspberry Pi can't drive something with a high um, high capacitance. The output starts to oscill oscillate. And then I put the scope probe um, uh, probe volt, uh, s uh, voltage scale to a 1x since there's no divider in this. Uh, and then the voltage levels here are, oh, uh, this should be, should be 20 millivolts. So they both should be on 20 millivolts. Okay, so 20 millivolts per division, and then I've got the time base set for two and a half milliseconds. The Raspberry Pi has a audio, um, and a, a audio Linux system architecture, uh, drivers that controls all the audio, and, um, I've set that to point to the analog outputs, the default points uh, to the HDMI cable. So I have a little script, or there's a command that I turned into a script that lets me uh, direct the audio to, to this um, analog output. And then there's also a speaker test program, which we're going to try to run right now. So we're going to hit, I don't know if you can see this, but we're going to hit enter. And the uh, the test has started, and you can see the signal the signal coming out. It's a little jumpy, and um, and it uh, the program only lasts for a certain amount of time. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to pause for a minute and um, I'll try it again with the uh, the right channel. All right, now we managed to type in the the command again. All right, it's running, and we should see. Okay, it's responded a little bit faster. The first time a program runs, it takes a minute to set up, and then the s s s subsequent times are a little bit quicker. So I I wrote a a uh, sort of like a a, pa a package and with two courses and um, downloaded it to the scope. And just to give you a, a feel for what it looks like is. Um, you can see that my two courses, the Raspberry Pi and the Ocean Sensor um, courses are here, and I've selected the Raspberry Pi course, and um, you can see over here is that the RPi Audio Lab is present on the scope, and if I select it, then you can see that the uh, little overview of um, using my computer, well, in this case, I use my phone connected over uh, a secure sockets connection, something similar to PuTTY, to the Raspberry Pi. And then I gave it commands to do generate tones. Um, and the output going through a breakout cable drives it to, to um, the two um, channels of the scope. So this gives you the overview. And then you can go to the procedure, and it shows you all the steps on, on what to do to set it up. So if you're an instructor or you want to, like, keep a list of tests or, or something that you do all the time, you don't kind of remember what the procedure is or how to set it up or if it's complicated, you can write down all the steps, store it to the scope, and use it to help you manage it with your, with your testing or setting up your t for your test. So it's kind of a neat feature. Um, it's it wasn't all that time consuming to set up, so uh, it looks like a pretty handy handy feature to have.
So if you do any work with electronics, you become a, a fan of the uh, of oscilloscopes. They are sort of like your workhorse piece of test equipment, and um, at least one of them. When I was in college, I, I uh, earned a bunch of money during the summer and purchased a, a scope. So the first scope I purchased is on the top here. It's a Tektronix uh, 2213. It's a dual channel. You can see it has dual channels, sort of mimics the uh, the new one. Um, and then um, it's uh, this one's 60 megahertz. The the digital one's 50 megahertz. Um, and you can see that the scope um, looks similar, but uh, the new ones are are simpler. All these soft buttons here uh, allow you to do all the controls that are little little buttons like the um, AC DC buttons are here. Channel one or channel two here. You can do uh, the vertical modes, alternate or chop. Uh, all your time base is here, and then all your trigger is here. So the there there's some similarities, but the new scopes really the, they're really much more powerful because you've got all the measurement tools. You've got the cursor tools. Um, it does the FFT, so they've they've come a long way, and then um, the the scopes are are uh, much smaller and lighter. This one is is I'm going to try a pan here. This one is really really deep here, um, so even though um, and, and um, it's been a, a long time uh, workhorse, um, so. Um, uh, so that goes back to somewhere I don't remember exactly, but uh, sometime around the late late 70s, early 80s. So it's a, the scope is quite old, and it's held up quite well. And if you take care of your scopes, uh, they can last you a, a very long time. And it's also very important to take care of the the uh, scope probes too, because they're a vital part of the instrument. So be careful with those too.